Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and today our topic is gain-of-function research. Biosecurity expert Dr. Gigi Gronval of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security returns to the podcast to talk about new oversight of research involving potentially dangerous pathogens and why this research is so important to improving our understanding of viruses and how to prevent future pandemics. Let's listen. Gigi Gronval, thank you so much for returning to Public Health On Call. Today, we're talking about gain-of-function research, and specifically, this past May, the White House announced some new guidelines and policies around this research. So let's start with just identifying, defining what is gain-of-function research. Yeah, so gain-of-function was a term that was created to describe some experiments that were done on H5N1 bird flu, which is in the news for another reason. And this was 10 years ago that this term was created. And it's been a controversial term because, you know, gain of what function? But really what people mean is gain of the functions of either transmissibility or pathogenicity. So making a virus worse. And that was important to figure out when these studies were done on avian flu 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago, because people were worried that H5N1 could jump from animals to humans and cause a pandemic. And people wanted to figure out if it was going to start spreading between mammals, what were those changes going to be and how can we look for it in surveillance? So it was an important public health measure. And so when you have gain-of-function research, I assume this takes place in a specific type of environment or setting and with specifically trained people? Yeah, whenever you're doing work on contagious pathogens, you have to do it in the right biosafety environment. So there are environments that are have a lot more engineered controls, you know, breathing apparatus is your so you're separating, you're creating layers between you and the pathogen. And that can be a variety of like airflow things, gloves, different kinds of hoods. But these are all in the categories of biosafety level three or four for that kind of work. And so these policies that came out in May, I assume there have always been policies around how this research is performed. But tell us a little bit about what happened in May. Sure. It was great that the White House released this policy, and they really tried to encompass a lot of the complexity that is in this work and a lot of the uncertainty. A lot of people, when they are looking at the kind of of gain-of-function or whatever kind of pandemic pathogen research, high-level stuff, they make a lot of assumptions that you you know what you're going to get when you do an experiment. That's just not the case, and there's a lot more uncertainty for scientists who are trying to figure out what these viruses are doing and why they behave the way they do. The policy has a lot more context. Unfortunately, that means that it's a lot more complicated and it's a lot, and it has an 84 page implementation guidance that comes along with it. But they basically break up different kinds of experiments into category one or category two, and they require different levels of oversight and with some experiments that are in Category 2 requiring federal department approval. So let's talk a little bit, you know, we're not going to get into the 84 pages, but let's talk a little bit about these different categories. So Category 1 research would include, like, what kinds of viruses or pathogens? So the the two kinds of categories, and I'm summarizing here, so Category 1 is with pathogens that are already select agents. So those are pathogens that require you to have a clearance from the Department of Justice, inspections by CDC. These things have been around for a long time. So it includes that kind of work or pathogens that require high containment. It also requires it to be something that might result in an experimental outcome that has already been defined, like 
if you're going to alter the host range of a pathogen. And it would be described as dual use research of concern. So it fits those these kinds of categories. So that's research that would require a mitigation plan in order to be funded. Category two is all of that plus. So it would be all of those things, but it would also involve what they're calling, it's a new term, a PEP, a pathogen with enhanced pandemic potential. So that's any pathogen that might work that might enhance that pathogen's transmissibility or virulence, might disrupt the effectiveness of pre-existing immunity. It's a lot more of the stuff that people get upset about. And they created this new term to make a break, I think, from some of the ire that is generated when you talk about gain of function or EPPP or other kinds of terms that have been used over the years. I always joke that, like, you know, if you've been in this field long enough on dual use research, that every few years is a new term. So here we are, we have a new term. Hopefully, this will be it for a few years until we get a new one, and uh, maybe in 2030. <laughs> and when you talk about the ire around it, like, I mean, tell us a little bit about what that means, because that kind of contributed to this, these new policies, right? So, yes, there's a lot of it has been the ire really stems from the original avian flu experiments that occurred over 10 years ago. But it was fueled again by discussions over SARS-CoV-2 and where it came from. And it has been used as a political tool to talk about, to accuse NIH of funding research that led to SARS-CoV-2. To be very clear, gain of function research had nothing to do with the origin of SARS-CoV-2. There is no virus that we know about that could be a precursor to SARS-CoV-2 with any sort of manipulation. You might hear some people say, oh, well, you know, the virus, we know that the Wuhan lab had a virus that was 96.3% identical to SARS-CoV-2. That sounds like a good amount of identity, but that's not it's actually quite a big distance apart because it wasn't like one chunk. It was lots of mutations, over a thousand mutations throughout the, the genome that would need to occur. It's, it's just not something that would happen in a lab. It is something that takes nature some decades to produce, but nature has a huge lab and can spend that time. It sounds like they were trying to really consolidate a lot of different suggestions around how this research should be done. But all of it also sounds like they are still supportive of the importance of research like this. You're creating policies so that this kind of research can continue. Is that is that accurate? That is absolutely accurate. Some previous proposals really would have put a, a stop to a lot of virology research in the United States. It would have really limited vaccine development and It's not sustainable. I mean, we need to make sure that the U.S. has the best public health surveillance and research that it can have. Otherwise, we're just going to be relying on other countries to produce research that is important to us, which is not good. So that was really welcome that they took that on. It is not an easy task. Like I mentioned earlier, this is complex and we are doing research only like in forward time. You're not doing the same thing again and again and then trying to refine the safety and security around that procedure. Virologists are trying to learn about the great unknown when it comes to virology. And if we knew why viruses became more transmissible or pathogenic, we would know a lot more than we do today. And so I teach a class on 1918 flu, and I always bring up about how it took over a decade for people to even learn in 1918, what caused that terrible pandemic. And we've made tremendous progress over the last 100 plus years in being able to figure out what's going on. And I hope that in 50 years, we're looking back now and saying, oh, you know, they did a pretty good job with creating those vaccines so quickly, but it was like within, you know, a couple of years, but they were doing the best they could. But Today, we are much better prepared. And I'd love for that to be, I'd like people to feel even more sorry for us that when they think about how much they know and how they can really speed up public health interventions. How, I mean, I know it's only been, you know, a month and a half or so since these policies came out. 
Do you have a sense of how they've been received and, and how they're being implemented yet? Implementation doesn't take place for until May 2025, which is great because I think that we need to have some workshops to think about like how this is going to work for specific research institutions. They have lots of good case studies in that 84-page guidance. So if you're working on a particular virus, you're doing this, that, and the other thing, what kind of review would you expect to go through? So all that's great, but I, it is going to take some adjustment and hopefully some people will be excited to, to pursue that. I think the reaction has been pretty positive from the scientific community. We're all just were really concerned that they were going to not be able to do their work at all. And given the pressing public health needs, that's not great. And so I think that people are cautiously optimistic and the people who are against research of all forms are unhappy with the policy, but that's good news too. (laughs) Well, I was actually going to ask you next. I mean, the policy changes got quite a bit of traction in the media. And I think that's because, you know, as you said earlier, more and more people are picking up this conversation, maybe through the negative things that have been said about it. How do you feel that these policies may help the conversation of promoting the idea that this is important research, that it is done in a safe way in very regulated, vetted conditions? Like, do you feel like the the policies could help do a little bit of maybe PR (laughs) around this kind of research? I think the policy seem, is sensible. I think that the PR is going to need to have people who are talking about it and why why reducing this to a political soundbite is not appropriate. I don't think I would have ever guessed that gain of function would be something that would be coming out in, in speeches from Marjorie Taylor Greene and Rand Paul, but it is. I think we're just going to have to keep educating and letting people know about why this research is important. And H5N1 and the the concerns about dairy cows is a good example of why it's important to have this research. We wouldn't know why we need to be concerned about this going on if we hadn't been doing the research on H5N1 to better understand this virus. And so we have good reasons to be supportive of this research and to make sure that it gets done with safe and secure policies in place. But yeah, there's the, it needs a lot more PR, good PR. Last question for you, and I want to kind of reiterate a point you made earlier. These policies don't imply that right now, you said this implementation goes in as of May 2025. This isn't the, implying that the research that's being done right now is just not subject to any regulation at all whatsoever. So I I just want to double down on the fact that like a lot of these policies clarified what was already in existence. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Thank you for for mentioning that. Yes, there are multiple policies and the point, one of the points of this one is to consolidate them into one. And so a lot of these things are, there's some new terminology that's in this new policy, but as far as the safety and security and review process, that's already in something that's happening now. Great. Well, Gigi, thank you so much for catching us up on this conversation. And we will check back with you maybe in May 2025 to see how this is actually playing out. Thank you very much. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace fernandez Ciciri. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production management by Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace fernandez Ciciri. Analytics by Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send us an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.